Hi there, I'm Zanny, the creator of the Healing and CPTSD community and the host of this show. If this is your first time here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Today, we have community member and very special guest, Stephanie Fu, who is a journalist, producer, and author of What My Bones Know, a memoir of healing from complex trauma. In today's episode, we dive deep into her book along with her experiences with CPTSD and healing from it. I truly feel as though Stephanie is paving the path for complex trauma survivors and having a voice and understanding that there is hope after trauma. Don't forget to leave a comment on your favorite part of the episode. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. So in your in your book, you share your personal journey discovering and living with CPTSD. How has uh, the process of writing and sharing your story contributed to your own healing? Um, I think that um, the process of sharing the story has probably been the most healing aspect of it. Just that it has been so wonderfully received by so many people. Um, I started to write this book and research it because I felt so freakish and alone and like I was the only person with complex PTSD. And now I just know that that's not true because this uh, enormous community has come out and, and shared with me that they feel similar things. They're like, you're telling my story as well. And so I know that this condition is not unique, that so many of us, even those who don't struggle with complex PTSD, struggle with a lot of these same feelings and um, insecurities and traumas. And so, you know, I I think it's been a really um, normalizing experience. Yeah, absolutely. And even like, even though clearly your trauma and my trauma was different and we went through different things, there was so much that you said that I was like, wow, I feel like she's like reading my mind right now. Like I feel the exact same way. So like it it, it was really cool to see that like, even though our traumas were different, the similarities and how we felt were so similar. And I think that's part of the the beauty of really talking about it and allowing, mm-hmm. even though it is a little bit different, you know? Yeah. In in your book, you share experiences with self-parenting and how it kind of helped you rebuild healthy self-talk. I was hoping that maybe you could explain that to the community, like what self-parenting looked like for you and any tips to get started. Um, yeah, I think that I had been practicing self-parenting for a long time, actually, just in therapy. I think most therapists had been trying to get me to have healthier self-talk. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think what really, um, made it feel more like parenting or made it feel sort of more emotionally deep is I think before I was kind of like, let me not hate myself. Let me not, Mm -hmm. let me not talk to myself as if I hate myself. And then the jump was, let me talk to myself as if I actually really love myself. Let me investigate Mm -hmm. what that would be like. And I think that was a really difficult headspace to get in because I just didn't understand what does it mean to love yourself? Like I I knew what it meant (laughs) to have romantic love with somebody else, but am I going to be in love with myself? I don't get it. And I think it took like um, experimenting with psychedelics and meditation to really be able to sit with, and also to a certain degree, IFS, just being able to sit with my inner child and loving and EMDR actually. Um, living, loving that inner child, understanding that like that child was not weak for wanting or needing support and help and kind talk and learning to give it to that child without feeling resentful or shameful. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything in the process that really helped you kind of start speaking kinder to yourself and having that self-love? I think it was a com- combination of all of those techniques. Um, yeah. Like I said in the book, um, I think what jump-started it probably was the EMDR because that focused, that forced me to really confront my child self and be in sort of very direct communication with her and feel like I needed mm-hmm. to protect her. Um, and then that was reinforced by meditation and psychedelics. Um, 
And then I think the rest of it really is practice. I mean, you can consistency. Yeah, right? you have you can have these moments of very brilliant kindness where you realize like, oh, I am my small child self deserved so much more. But if you don't take that knowledge and then sort of try and incorporate it into your everyday life, try and um make it a daily practice it doesn't quite have the same effect yeah yeah consistency and constantly speaking to yourself is how it like really kind of like sinks into that subconscious right and really makes it start being more natural yeah i mean you're building you're literally building new neural pathways you have yeah you have some messed up neural pathways that that were sort of the 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 switches and the wires are crossed and you got to get them to go the right way and the only way to do it is by practice like any other skill. Yeah. You are a self-described workaholic or you were. <laughs> yeah. Um which I know like speaks to my soul so much. Um where do you think the desire to treat trauma with productivity and ambition come from? I mean, I know in my case definitely my parents, my immigrant parents mm -hmm. who literally would punish me if I didn't get the highest score on the test, if I didn't yeah. achieve constantly. Um, so I came, they, I mean, they taught me that my self-worth was dependent entirely on my academic output. So there's yeah. definitely that in my culture and my family, but um, I don't think it's unique to Asian American community or my family, I think that we live in a capitalistic system where unfortunately, you know, Jeff Bezos is the most famous guy in the world and is lauded for having a jillion dollars um, rather than a, you know, person who runs a soup kitchen who takes really incredible care of um, yeah. unhoused people. So that's, that's what our society values. So what are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. Um, so sort of disentangling myself from those capitalistic expectations or realizing that they were sort of, yeah. uh, capitalistic propaganda was really important to convincing myself that no, in fact, I wasn't being lazy and no, in fact, no. like historic, <laughs> not yeah. at all. And the 40 hour work week or the 60 hour work week or whatever is a total social construct that we have just made up mm -hmm. that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. 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 So a lot of just having the knowledge of how our culture actually works and what we're being conditioned mm -hmm. with. Is there anything um, outside of the knowledge and awareness that really helped kind of allow you to release that mindset? <laughs> I think I was really lucky in being able to quit my job. Um, not everybody's able to do that. Not everybody's able to work less. Um, I had saved up very carefully for a long time to be able to do yes. that. I didn't, I'm not rich by any means. Um, I have to work still. <laughs> but um, yeah, the fact that I was able to save up to take six months off and um, I think I use that time well in that, especially in the past couple of years, I've really tried to focus on getting my self-worth from other places besides my career. Um, mm -hmm. And that has mm -hmm. meant really diversifying my life in terms of spending more time gardening, spending more time in the plant community, mm -hmm. making friends outside of the journalism world, outside of my career. Um, yeah lots of friends who don't care about what I do at all or who I am and rather care more about like my jokes or the time that I spend with them or the care that I give them, you yeah. know, and building those relationships, which I think are very healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like when it comes to like attachment trauma, you kind of have to heal through relationships with others as well mm -hmm. so that you can have those types of healthy relationships. Absolutely. Um, 
I love that. Uh, so one of my favorite parts of the book, and I know you've spoken about this, was when you first discovered Dr. Ham and he was talking about the Incredible Hulk. Um, so I was just hoping you could share with the community how we may have more in common with the Hulk than we realize. Yeah. So basically, he told me that um, the Hulk, um, which I didn't really, I actually am a Marvel Comics fan, but I'm not a big Hulk fan. So I didn't really know the Hulk's whole like origin Has that story. changed now? Well, I are you a fan? Now? I still haven't really, I have to say, I haven't really watched any Hulk <laughs> movies or anything, but ideologically I'm a fan. Theoretically I'm a fan. <laughs> um, the Hulk or Bruce Banner was actually abused as a kid and his mom was abused. His dad was an alcoholic. He went through a lot of trauma and then he like fell into radioactive goo or something and he became the Hulk. And um, what happened is that his rage that he possesses from that abuse, when he feels rage, he becomes this giant beast. And becoming the Hulk is very much like being triggered in that like, you were very um, dumb. <laughs> like you can only speak in one word sentences. You're not able to have like the logic and the higher level thinking and the rationale that often you are when you are not triggered. And there's just a lot of like, grr, Hulk smash, um, Hulk protect. <laughs> But, you know, it's really important to remember that the Hulk is not a villain. The Hulk is a good guy. Mm. The Hulk is a critical part of the Marvel Universe. He is everybody's yeah. friend. And he is really, really helpful in protecting his friends and his loved ones uh, with his Hulk smash when he can get it under control. Um, right. And so I think that's the key is basically learning when to let the Hulk out in appropriate moments when you need to things smashed and when to calm him down when you don't really need him at that moment and say like Hulk, everything is okay. Yeah, I absolutely adore that. And is there any ways that have helped you kind of get control of your own inner Hulk? Um, I think. Yeah, I think a lot of consistency in practice, um, mindfulness, mm -hmm. breathing, practice, mm. um, and a lot of curiosity and trying to consider what is really happening and questioning that a lot. Just constantly, I think when I was diagnosed, I started questioning what is real um and mm. what is my complex ptsd and at first that was really painful and hard because i was like i'm crazy everything i see is wrong and then over time when i was able to have a more curious mindset about that um and just again question whenever i got mad or whenever somebody was slighting me just like wait is this really happening is this person actually yeah. like coming after me is this in my head um how could this be reinterpreted and how can I like get clarity on this situation to really find yeah. out whether I should bring out the Hulk or not? Like what questions can I ask? Yeah. You know, um, I think has been really helpful. Absolutely. And I feel like too, in the beginning, when you start getting curious, right, it's really hard to determine if it is your trauma speaking, if it is the time would you say that that gets easier as you continue the consistent effort of asking these questions and going through? Absolutely. Yes. Um, a lot of the time, the questions don't come with so much shame now. They, again, mm -hmm. they are just curiosity. They are more just like, hmm, what is really happening? And how can I figure this out? Um, or just less dread, less feeling like mm -hmm. if I ask these questions, I'm going to be abandoned because the more mm -hmm. times that you ask questions and you try and make repairs and you're received with kindness or um, generosity or genuineness, the more you're like, oh, asking the questions is the safer way than just blowing up. Right. Asking the questions is helpful. This is like helping me repair. Like it's possible to repair without just ending yeah. or leaving or raging. And so yeah. the more you get that positive reinforcement, the safer it becomes to interact with people yeah. in these ways. Absolutely. And it shows how important it is to have 
those people that you're asking the questions to as well and communicating with to be safe people Mm -hmm. and not people that are reinforcing those old beliefs. Definitely. You start like moving away from people who you start seeing like, oh, if I ask this person, hey, are you mad or what's going on right now or whatever? And they are and they clarify and they're honest with you and they're like, oh, no, I had a really bad day or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, okay. I feel safe. That's great. Right. And then you ask somebody else that same question and they're like, fuck you for asking. Well, then now, you know, maybe <laughs> this person isn't someone that you might want to have in your life so much. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice for the community as well. And it gives a little bit of hope too, right? That somebody who's been there, it, it does get a little bit easier mm-hmm. as the process goes. Definitely. Um,